Before you sit down, I want to read you a scripture from Galatians. It said, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Abba is the, is the Aramaic word for dad. The spirit that is in you and in me, whether you know it or not, whether you're a Jesus follower or not, there's a spirit in you that cries out, Dad! Calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave to shame, no longer a slave to sin, no longer a slave to guilt and hypocrisy and resentment and anger and fear and dread and depression and anxiety but you are a son of God a child of God that's who you are because he says you are you know how you know how some parents say because I told you so you do that because I told you so he said you are who you are because I said that's who you are you're a child of God he's trying to upgrade you he's trying to upgrade you from from slave to son, from detainee to daughter, from prisoner to free. He's trying to upgrade you. So here's what I want, here's what I want you to do this morning. Before you sit down, would you turn to somebody next to you and tell them my sermon title. Tell them, accept your upgrade. Tell them, accept your upgrade. And you may have a seat. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm good. I'm, I'm good. Like, I'm, I'm happy already. I'm, I can just go home right now. I feel so happy. But I am going to preach. Don't let that make you sad. Stay happy. Um, you know, we've been in this series, this, this series for the last few weeks. If you haven't been following it, you can go online and, and check it out. Um, because it's, it's I'm, not saying this, the, <laughs> I'm not saying the preaching is great, but the, the letter that we're studying is amazing. It's amazing and it's kind of hard to preach because it's all about uh, this idea of receiving the gift that has already been bestowed to you and you know it's easier to preach like a seven-point sermon about what you need to do to get your life straight you know no you, got, you don't even want that sermon but it's easier to preach a sermon like that than to say here's what God wants you to do receive his grace and, and every sermon in this series has been that it's ended with receive his grace spoiler alert that's how it's going to end today too, okay? Receive his grace. Accept your upgrade. My, my wife and I were traveling recently and we were coming back from a trip to see my mom. It was her birthday and we came, we were on our way there and then we came back and we were trying to save a little money on the tickets. So I bought my plane ticket, um, you know, full price, but we have a friend that works for the airlines and so Rebecca reached out to them and to our friends and said, hey, do you guys have any friends and family passes that, that we could have? Um, and they said, sure. And so our friends gave us a friends and family pass. So, so Rebecca was on a friends and family pass. She was on a free ride. And I was, on a, I was on a paid ride. A paid ride. I paid for that ticket. I paid for that. And she was riding for free. And I paid for mine. Okay? So, and we're, we got the tickets at different times. So we weren't allowed to sit next to each other. Not, not, not allowed. But we weren't, our seats were not next to each other. So I'm sitting in my spot. She's sitting in hers. And I notice that as the flight takes off, a flight attendant comes walking down the aisle, goes over to Rebecca, leans over, whispers something, not whispers, but says something to Rebecca. Rebecca gets up and moseys right on up to first class. <laughs> and I was like, um, excuse me. Uh, so I did that thing where I'm like looking around like, what's going on here? And I noticed that there was actually an extra seat next to her in first class. And so I just hit my little ding, my little button, and the flight attendant comes over and I said, oh, I noticed that you escorted my wife into the first class section where she is now luxuriating in a wide seat, whereas I am in between two people and eating stale peanuts and so forth. So anyway, 
if it would be all right with you, I'd like to join my wife in first class. And the flight attendant, very nice, very congenial, says to me, well, you see, you have a, a paid ticket. So for you to be moved to first class would require you to have paid more to upgrade your ticket because you have a paid ticket. Your wife has a friends and family pass. In other words, the airlines gave her this ticket. Therefore, she can sit wherever the airlines pleases to sit her. So while you're back here eating your stale crackers, she's up here eating her salmon and champagne or whatever it is that they have up in first class. And you, sir, need to stay right where you're at, right? Because I had a paid ticket. So if I'm going to get a better upgrade, I got to pay for it. I got to earn it. I got to deserve it. She received a free ticket. Therefore, God could just upgrade her wherever, I'm sorry, Delta wanted her to go. This is the reality, reality about our work and our grace. And as followers of Jesus, as religious folk, we kind of get that confused every once in a while. We get it kind of messed up. And so the Apostle Paul writes a letter to us through a group of people called the Galatians. And they lived in an area called Galatia and he had preached to them and he had preached a very simple sermon and he had preached to them a year earlier. He said, Jesus died for you. Jesus was buried and Jesus rose again. Here's the application to my three part sermon. Put your faith in Jesus, put your faith in his sacrifice and be free. That was his sermon. A year later, he finds out that they're doing what we do. They're trying to earn their way. They're trying to buy their way into God's good grace through the observance of religious laws and religious practices. Somebody had messed with their mind and said, yes, God's grace is free, but you still need to earn it. You still need to work for it. You still need to obtain it through your religious achievements. And he says, no, 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 no. That's not what it is. I, I preached a very simple sermon to you, and it's not a performance-based faith. It's a gifts-based faith. It's a, it's a kind of faith where you just receive what I have for you. Stop trying to earn it through religious observances and religious rituals. That's religion. That's not the relationship that I have extended to you by the grace of Jesus. So don't do that. But we do this. We do this. All of us do this. We cannot help ourselves because grace is counterintuitive. We don't, we can't imagine that we don't get what we deserve, right? God says, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make you my child, whether you deserve it or not. And you know you don't deserve it, if I can just put that out there right now this morning. If you, you know you don't deserve it, right? Like, you know that, right? Like, if God, if God took the thoughts that you've had just this year, not even your words or your actions, just your thoughts, and put them up on this screen, Do you want that? Do you want your search history blasted across Facebook? Do you really want that, right? We don't get what we deserve, thank God, right? Because he wants to give us grace, but we keep relying on what we call, last week I was talking about performance-based faith. And there are consequences when we rely on performance-based faith instead of relying upon the good grace of God and the gift of God. And the consequences that we face with performance-based faith is that Performance-based faith, in other words, trying to live up to the standard in order to achieve God's, God's acceptance, increases your alienation. And, and the reason is this. Intimacy requires authenticity. You, you, can't, you can't be intimate with someone if all you're revealing is the good stuff, right? That's a performance-based faith. You, you can't have a relationship with someone if, all your, if your life is like an online dating profile where you've, you've given yourself a couple inches in height. Come on, somebody. You've, dropped, you, you've trimmed a couple pounds off your profile. You've added a zero to your income, right? Because you're, you're, you're in performance-based faith mode. You can't have intimacy with someone if you're in performance-based faith. You have to be able to reveal all of yourself. And when you, are, when you recognize that the grace of God is a free gift, then you are able to reveal your whole self because you know you don't deserve it anyway. So you're not trying to put on a front. You're not trying to be, put on a mask to, to prove to God that you deserve what you're getting. You go, oh my gosh, you love me. You pulled me up out of the miry clay. 
I was down in the muck and the mud and you pulled me out, right? So it increases our alienation when we try to put on a performance for God. The second thing is that it breeds hypocrisy. It breeds hypocrisy. If you are here last week, you heard the story that I told about, you know, I grew up in a preacher's home and, and my grandfathers were both pastors and, and my, my, you know, my uncles are pastors. So as a preacher's kid, I got really good at obeying the letter of the law while breaking the spirit of the law. Do you know what I mean? Like I could, I could actually follow the rules my old youth pastor is here today, so you might know some of this stuff. Uh, I, I, I could follow the technical rules while breaking the spirit of the rules because I was trying to perform my way into God's good grace. So when there was a rule in my household that said, you may not smoke cigarettes, that was a rule. I had a rule, no smoking cigarettes. I said, I can obey that rule, but I can also get around that rule by crushing up my mom's cinnamon potpourri rolling it in post-it pads, going out to the fort and smoking it. It was cinnamon potpourri. It wasn't a cigarette. You know what I mean? So I could look my mom in the face. You should go on last week and, and listen to that story. I could look at my mom in the face and go, I haven't broken the rule, right? Because it's performance-based faith. Come on, somebody, help me out here. The other thing is it confuses new believers. When you try to tell somebody, Jesus died for you, he loves you, he's given his grace and mercy to you, and you need to follow all these rules in order to actually obtain it, it's very confusing. The Bible says, Paul said, even Barnabas, one of the followers of Jesus, was confused by the mixed message that he was receiving from followers of Jesus who said, grace plus a ton of other stuff will get you into God's good grace. He said, no, 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 that's not what I preached. That's not, that's not what I preached. So, so it confuses new believers and it alienates outsiders. It, it, it disillusions them. They, you, you know, Christians tend to think that if, if I put on a front, if I perform well enough, people won't notice that I'm a real person with like the, you know, darkness in my heart also, right? They won't notice that. And it's kind of like when my three-year-old, Eden, she doesn't want me to see her. And she goes, I don't want you to see me, dad. And she covers her own eyes. Spoiler alert, don't tell Eden this. I can still see her, even though she's covered her eyes. When, when, as, when as followers of Jesus, we try to put on a performance for people who aren't believers to act like we're somebody that we're not, guess what? They can still see you. All right? They know what's going on. They, they, they know. So it disillusions outsiders when we try to live this performance-based faith. But perhaps the worst part about it is that it undermines the sacrifice of Jesus. It devalues it. You see, if, if, if we could earn it on our own, Apostle Paul asked this in, in, in another part of the letter. He says, if you're so good that you can accomplish it on your own, then why did Jesus have to die? Well, I mean, why did he die? If you could just make it, if you could just run the race all on your own, you're good enough to live up, then why did he have to die? Why did he go through that? And he pleads with them in this letter because these are people that he loves. He loves them. He planted this church. He loves these people. And he's, and he's saying, look, I don't want you to, to, to fall back into this performance-based faith. I want you to be free. I want you to accept the upgrade that you received when God died for you, when Jesus died for you. You became a son. Don't re-enslave yourself. Don't put yourself back into bondage. You've been liberated by the grace and the mercy of Jesus, somebody. So he's preaching to a group of people who are not like out there just doing all kinds of bad stuff. They're not lying and cheating and stealing. And they're actually trying to live out their faith, but they're relying upon their own adherence to their faith in order to receive their own righteousness. And he goes, that's not what you do, man. Because that will be just as much of a bondage for you as the bondage that you were in when you were still in sin. You understand what I'm saying? There's two kinds of bondage. The bondage of sin, the bondage of religion. They're, they're, they're essentially two sides of the same coin. He's saying, don't do that. Accept your upgrade. In fact, he gets passionate. He loves these people. They trust him. So he can say this. You foolish Galatians. What's the matter with you? Right? When I was, when I was a kid and I would read this letter, um, I was reading it in the, the King James English, which is the devil scaring version of the Bible. Somebody, come on. You know what I'm talking about. The devil hears thou and runs out of the... There's only a few people that are chuckling at that, but you... I'm with you. You're with me. Okay. Um, 
So, so I, I read this letter and I thought that the Apostle Paul was angry at people because they were failing to live up to the standards of religious practice that he had imparted to them. And he, I thought he was going, what's the matter with you? You got to start stepping it up. You got to start living right. Well, it's just the opposite of that. They were living right. They were trying their hardest to live up to God's standard. And he was saying, no, 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 no. Don't do that in order to get God's grace. Don't try to get what you've already got. Don't try to buy what's already been paid for. Don't be foolish. Somebody has bewitched you. Somebody has fooled you, right? Look what he says here. I would like to learn just one thing. Here's what he says. Then he kind of gets, you know how when somebody just, there's this hint of, of, of sarcasm here. Tell me just, just tell me this. Tell me just this one thing. Did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Like, did you, did God come into your life because you were so good? I mean, ask yourself that, of those of you who experienced God's grace in your life. Were you just so good that God said, man, I better, I better break off something for this guy because he's so amazing, right? <laughs> right? I better just give him some because he's, he's incredible. He's so morally pure. This guy's pure as the, as the driven snow. I better extend some grace to him, right? Or did you receive it just because you received it, because you believed on his death, burial, and resurrection, and you received the grace of mercy in, in, in your life? Wh which one is it, right? It's a rhetorical question, but he keeps going. I love it. He says, are you, are you that crazy? Like, after beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Like, after you got this grace, after you got this freedom, are you going to try to work it out now for the rest of your life? Are you going to try to to try to earn it now because it was given to you for free but now you're going to try to earn it i had another like meta like like illustration in my mind when i read this another airplane illustration it'd be like going up ten thousand feet in an airplane and the airplane has taken you up there and and then you go up the aisle to the pilot and you go pardon me thank you so much for taking me off the ground and bringing me to ten thousand feet and, and and taking me to my destination I'm going to go ahead and step out of the exit here because I'll just, I'll just go ahead and fly home for the rest of the way, right? I got this on my own. I'll just flap my wings, right? That's what it would be like. He's saying, look, the Spirit is what gave you life. Are you going to try to now get life through your works? Because it won't, it won't go well. You will actually come crashing to the ground. You will not fly on your own. It's, it's, it's God's grace that frees you. It's not your work that frees you, right? In fact, he says you will crash to the ground. He says this. Anybody who relies on the works of the law are under a curse. If you, if you try to rely on just how good you are, you're going to be crushed by it. You're under a curse as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Everything. 613, book, 613 commandments in the Torah. Are you following all of them to the T? Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> one person <laughs> deceit no. right i'll give you an example there's one little commandment that i know i don't know all of them i i have memorized them all but one of them says love your neighbor love your neighbor that's just one of 613. i like my neighbors i like them i really do i might even love some of them do i really love do i love the ones that come flying down my street at 47 miles per hour when my kids are playing in the front yard I don't, I mean, I want to throw spike strips out in front of their, I have fantasies about, like, huge, uh, whatever those things are called, the bumps, speed bumps. You know, like, like, I don't think I can, I don't know that I even obey one commandment fully, because actually that commandment has a second part to it, love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. Do I love my neighbor as much, do you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself? Are you up at night worrying about whether your neighbor's children are going to get into a good school? Like, are you up at night figuring out how to pay for your kids, your neighbor's kids' education? Are you? Because that's what it means to love somebody as much as you love yourself. You love them as much, you love their kids as much as you love your kids. You love, you want the best for them as much as you want the best for them. None of us follow this rule. And this is just one of 613. He says, look, if you're relying upon your observance of the law, you're, you're, you're toast. You're not going to get there. You're not going to, none of us do it. And the scripture says, unless you follow all of them, then you're cursed by it. So what is going on, right? I mean, I had somebody ask me this question. This is the question that I ask when I read this passage. This is the question that the apostle Paul anticipated that we would ask. The question is this, why then was the law given at all? Like, why was God, 
Why did God give us commandments that we literally cannot follow? Why, why did he require of us stuff that we can't actually pull off? Like, why did he do that? And the Apostle Paul gives us this beautiful explanation, this beautiful uh, example of what the law is all about. Here's what he says in the next verse. He says, the law was our guardian. The law was our guardian until Christ came. It's a really interesting word that he uses here, guardian. The Greek word that he uses is, is pedagogos, which is where we get the word pedagogue. A pedag a pedagogos is, in the first century, it was a legally appointed servant that was authorized to train, discipline, chastise, instruct, protect, and supervise a child 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So wealthy Jews and wealthy Greeks and wealthy Romans would have a servant in their house that was assigned to their children. And that servant would, would, would literally get that child up in the morning, get that child dressed, dressed, brush their teeth, take them to school, get them, get them to class, carry their books, bring them home, make sure that they didn't do anything that they weren't supposed to do, protect them, guard them, discipline them, instruct them, lead them, guide them. And that was great. That was good. You need that for a child, right? But the child was completely under the supervision, under the lock and key of the pedagogue. The, child, the, the father authorized the pedagogue to rule the child. The child's relationship with the pedagogue was like the servant to the servant. Are you with me? And the, and, and the, and the apostle Paul says, this is what the law is like. It's like tries to keep us protected and disciplined and fortified. And, and in fact, some of the pedagogues in the first century, there's an ancient uh, writer, a Stoic Greek writer. This is what he writes about the pedagogues. He said, pedagogues are guards. They are keepers. They're a fortified wall. They're a protective wall. They're like a prison. It's like the strictest babysitter you've ever had, right? Who's literally keeping you in line. That was the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law was to protect us and keep us and guide us. But this is what the Apostle Paul says. It says, he says, the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by, come on, faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. So it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful analogy that he's drawing here. He's saying, look, the guardian is good. The guardian instructs you as to what's right and what's wrong. But the goal of life is not to stay under the supervision of the guardian. The, the, the goal of life is to be liberated because you don't need the guardian. You don't, you, you don't need the, 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 the guardian to pull you by the ear and, and direct you where you should go. So this, this last week, we, uh, you know, school started, New City School District, our kids started uh, school this week. And one of the things that I love at the, at the high school, New City High School, they roll out the red carpet. They, they welcome all the kids back to school. It's just an awesome thing. And we go out, several of us, every year. And we go out there and just welcome all the kids back. And it's really fun. 6.30 in the morning. I'm a morning person, so I'm into it. It's fun. It's a blast. The kids, on the other hand, are kind of like not that into it. Like at that time, they're just kind of like, what is going Why are these people clapping for us? But, but we go out. And, and this year, we were out there at the high school. And the post-dispatch showed up. And they were taking pictures. And then somebody sent me some pictures, and this is a picture of my wife greeting some of the students and welcoming them, them back. And Dr. Uh, Sharonic Harden Bartley, our superintendent, was there. We're having a good time, and this guy was having fun. He was enjoying it, and he was really soaking it in. Um, and I kind of got caught up in the excitement and the, and the enthusiasm of it. And the guy got a picture of, of, of my greeting with this kid here. <laughs> this guy is going to be traumatized for like the whole semester. He's like, I really did not expect that level of excitement. And I love how Tyler's kind of poking over the top like, hey, man, welcome. So glad you're here. Um, OK, you can take that down. Uh, listen, we want our kids, right? We, this, is the, this is the illustration. We want our kids to be protected. We want them to come on a bus with a supervisor. We want them to come through kind of literally a gauntlet of people who are going to like watch them and observe them. We want them to be under the supervision of the district. Of the, of the teachers and of the principal and of the superintendent, right? But the goal is not for the child to stay in school forever, right? The goal is to graduate the child. If your child graduates from high school and then re-enrolls as a freshman, you would say, you foolish Galatian, why are you re-imprisoning yourself when you've already been liberated from the thing that you just came through? See, the guardian is there to get us somewhere. It's not there to keep us in that place. 
Now, the question that people ask, and I had several conversations about this this week, and I'm, you guys, we're just in the weeds. We're just like going deep into theology. So if you get sort of totally confused about any of this, um, just email me. I'll try to re-explain it. But, but, but we sometimes wonder, okay, so did, did Jesus just wipe out the law? Did God give this incredible 613 commandments? Jesus came and said, that's not important. Is that what happened? That's not what happened. That's not what happened. Look what Jesus says about the law. He says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law. I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come, he said, to fulfill them. I've come to fulfill them. And he says this, I'll tell you this. Until heaven and earth disappears, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He says, I'm not getting rid of the law. In fact, he says later in the passage, I'm not gonna, I don't have the scripture up here, but he says later in the passage, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, then you have no chance of getting into the kingdom of heaven. So, so the law is in place. The law is intact. The law is still there. The requirements and the justice and the righteousness of God is still there. And yet we can't seem to to live up to them. And Jesus says, I have actually fulfilled them. I've come to fulfill them. And then my question is, how did you do that? How did you fulfill the law for me? Because if I can't live it out, how did you live it out on my behalf? The Apostle Paul says this. He says, Christ redeemed us from the weight, from the curse, from the heaviness of the law by becoming Come on, somebody, listen. Becoming a curse for us. This is, this is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that he imparts his righteousness to you through his sacrifice. He takes your sin upon himself. In fact, the Apostle Paul quotes another Old Testament scripture. He says, it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Scripture says this, Deuteronomy, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree or a cross or a pole. They're cursed. Why? Because when you see them, when you see them and you look across the landscape and you see someone hung on a, on a cross or on a tree or on a pole, you go, look, they, they're neither in heaven nor are they on earth. And it looks, like, it looks like heaven has rejected them and earth has rejected them. They're cursed. It's the most deplorable kind of death that you could experience. And Jesus says, sign me up for that. I will take on the curse that, that, that you actually deserve, and I will bear that curse. I will carry that curse so as to redeem you from the curse of not only sin, but of your own religious practice. I will redeem you by becoming a curse. I'm gonna close with this little story that some of you may have read last semester, at the end of last semester. Um, uh, a guy named Robert Smith gave a commencement speech at Morehouse College. And, you know, commencement speeches are notoriously boring. There are lame jokes, and it's just, you kind of just check out. You graduated, you don't want to hear it. But this guy gets up at Morehouse and he starts to give a, a speech. And something he said piqued everybody's attention. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said it better, but I'm still just paraphrasing. He said, listen, I don't want you to be. I don't want you to be, you know, captured by your debt. I want, I want, because of your conviction and your creativity, I want you to be free to do what you are called to do. So here's what I'm going to do, he says, for the class of 2019. He says, I am going to pay off all of your student loans. That's what he said. Everybody here, I'm just covering your student loans. Just, just you guys, just the class of 2019, right? I know some of you college students are like, wait, what college was that? And where do we sign up? What's happening next year, right? It was about 40 million, it was about a $40 million ticket. It completely wiped the slate clean of about, of about 400 students' debts. And some of the students' debts were up to $200,000. I mean, there was significant debt. Now here's the reality. It wasn't that the debt was just removed. The debt was there. The school didn't say, you don't owe us the money. They still owed the money. It's just that somebody came in and paid for it on their behalf. Somebody just came along and said, I got this. Did you do anything to deserve it? No. I got this. Here's what, here's what 
Paul is trying to teach us. Here's what God is trying to convey to somebody here, somebody. And that is this. The debt of your shame and the debt of your guilt and the debt of the sins that you have committed that nobody else in here knows about and the debt of your anxiety and the debt of your worries and, and watch this. The debt of the sins that you will commit tomorrow, tomorrow, he paid for those. He made himself a curse to relieve you from the curse of the weight of living up to the standard that God has for each and every one of us. So he's telling somebody here today, and I hope you receive it. I just pray that you receive it. Stop trying to earn it. Stop trying to pay for it. Stop trying to buy it. Just accept your upgrade. Receive it. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for you as we close. And I want to pray that this very counterintuitive truth sinks so deep in your heart that you leave here liberated in ways that you can't even, you can't even express. You don't even know how to talk about. I want you to do this. I want you to just take a moment before we dismiss. We're okay on time. Let me just, let me get your attention, right? I want you to focus for a moment on God's gift for you. Just stop for a moment and receive his grace this morning. This isn't just for, oh, you know, sinners far from God. No, he's preaching to religious people. He's preaching to Christians that are trying to live out their faith and trying to do their best. Right? Because we get caught in the same trap. It's just two sides of the same coin. And he's saying to you and he's saying to me today, accept your upgrade. Let's pray. Father, we come before you right now. I thank you for every person in this space. I thank you, God, that you are able to break through even our biggest walls and our biggest cynicism and our greatest fear and our greatest uh, just just our, our all, 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 the, all the garbage that we have built up in our life you break through it you just break through it our shame, our guilt, our fear, all of it you just break through it, pierce through it with the truth of your gospel and that is that we are saved by grace through faith in you and we just trust the sacrifice that you have made for us and I pray God that every person in here today would receive a an absolutely pure fresh understanding of who they are in you by virtue of the sacrifice that you made for us. Let us receive your grace. Let us accept your upgrade. To your honor, to your glory, and to your power, we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. God bless you guys. I love you. I'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week.